Hi, Jim. Thank you for having me. Um, so we started, I started journeying into plant-based nutrition back in the 80s, a long time ago. I'm dating myself. Um, my, I met my husband when I was in high school, and my husband is Nelson Campbell, and his father is Dr. T. Colin Campbell. So, you mm -hmm. know, I, I, I got a front seat to everything that was going <laughs> on in nutrition. It was, it was really fun. So one of my passions when I met Nelson was nutrition. And um, I, that's what I wanted to study in college. So Colin was just getting the data back from his China study at that time. Well, right. actually, it was a little bit later than that. But so I went to college to study dietetics. And um, boy, I was really disillusioned because it was not the nutrition that he was talking about. So right. I, I left the nutrition program after a couple of years and got my degree in teaching. Um, then Nelson and I got married and had three children following that. And I still was very interested in nutrition, but the world was not really listening to, I think, what Colin's research was proposing. Mm -hmm. um, so we started really doing it well, I would say, after the kids were born, which was in the early 90s. But I was doing mm -hmm. some of it in the 80s. But, the, you know, that was a time when plant-based nutrition and veganism wasn't all that popular. So there weren't cookbooks, there weren't, you know, the really interesting products and ingredients that you could play with. So mm. I, I got more serious in the 90s. And now, of course, we're whole food plant-based and haven't gone back. So it's, that's, that's, that's been my journey. That was 35 <laughs> like years you ago. <laughs> Like you say, pretty uh, pretty incredible to have a front seat with um, Dr. Dr. Campbell there. Uh, I think yeah, a well-known name with obviously within the sort of plant-based and vegan community. So um, yeah, I can imagine that was uh, that was pretty awesome to have that kind mm -hmm. of uh, insight. Uh, thinking about the kind of the uh, the cookbooks and so on that you mentioned, when did that kind of as a as a concept for you personally come into your your sort of view? Right. So I left teaching. I was teaching right up until about 2012. And Nelson produced a film called, I'm sure you might be aware of it, called Plant Pure Nation. Mm -hmm. And I was part of that film and we did jump starts and we were getting people in our community on a plant-based diet. And it just kept growing and getting bigger and bigger. And so that's when Nelson had the aha moment and he made a documentary called Plant Pure Nation. So he was gone mm -hmm. a lot. I was instrumental in, in sort of designing the meal plans and the recipes for people. So I decided that I would write a cookbook. I had no idea what I was getting into because I've been <laughs> cooking ever since I was a kid. And that's it's something I love to do. But I really didn't know until I started writing this cookbook. Then we contacted a publishing company, the same publishing company that worked with Colin on his book, The China Study in Whole. Mm -hmm. And we wrote, uh, I wrote Plant Pure Nation Cookbook. So that was the first one. And then the recipes just kept piling in. So I wrote another one called Plant Pure Kitchen. And then just recently during the pandemic, I wrote Plant Pure Comfort Food Cookbook, which um, kind of stems from all the things that I've been doing. But I think my passion around this book was that I wanted to get mainstream folks to do this diet, to try this diet. So mm. I was really using a lot of traditional comfort foods um, and not just all American, but all over the world, you know, think cultures mm. like, you know, Indian culture and the Mexican cuisine and Middle Eastern cuisine. So I have a lot of, I would call those comfort foods around the world. So that's what this book really, um, I think is, is good and what it's going to be known for. The title, Comfort Food. <laughs> Tell, tell us a little bit about the creative process of coming up with a recipe for a cookbook as opposed to, you know, sort of a, the in-home kind of cooking experience. Right, right. Um, when I find recipes, I typically don't go to vegan websites or vegan cookbooks. I sort of rely on my own abilities, but I also go to people, um, you know, like Bobby Flay and Giada and Rachel Ray and some of the more traditional foodies and I look at what they're doing because that's what people love and then I make mm. substitutions 
But I think what happens is people make substitutions. They forget to fill in the blanks. And if you're going to take something out of a recipe, you need to fill in the blanks with something that's really strong and um, really is going to make that recipe sing. So then I make my substitutions. I take out the oil. We don't use any, and at Plant Pure, we don't use processed oils. Uh, we don't mm. use many processed cheeses and meats. So some, you know, sometimes I use a little bit, but for the most part, I don't use any of that. So I have to figure out substitutions uh, that are whole food plant based. So things like soy curls. I don't know if you're familiar with soy curls. Yeah. Um, lentils. I use olives. I use different kinds of nuts and seeds. You just have to get really creative with the substitutions. But I, I think a lot of people, when they take a traditional recipe and they veganize it, they they forget to fill in the blanks. So that's that's my process. And then sometimes I'll go into the vegan community and say, okay, so what did they do with a, a, jack, a, a jackfruit slider, for example? And I'll look and, and kind of get some ideas that way. But so then sometimes I just come up with something all by myself, uh, but sometimes that's a little bit weird. So I need a lot of testers because I never know. I mean, it tastes great to me, but I don't know if it tastes great to everybody else. But that's pretty much my process. I have a lot of magazines and traditional things in my um, cabinets that I use when I'm creating cookbooks. So that's that's my process. Pretty simple. You mentioned the kind of processed uh, foods in there and, I, and and sort of using those really sparingly, the, the cheeses and the, the mm-hmm. meats and so on. And as, as you've, you've seen sort of plant-based nutrition and veganism over the over the decades, uh, and most recently it feels like there's been an explosion in that kind of world, mm-hmm. do you think there's a bit of a, a danger almost that when we, when we think substitution uh, for those folks who are perhaps newer into the, the world of, of plant-based nutrition, that we instantly turn to the kind of off-the-shelf, bought, processed, uh, as opposed to thinking more creatively as you're doing? Right. I think... I think- Going in the vegan world is wonderful. There's a lot of reasons to be vegan, but I think we should be vegan Mm. for all three of them. The climate, that's something we're very passionate about, the animals and the health. If you're trying to enhance your health, (laughs) I think eating those processed vegan products can be tricky. And I don't know if you're doing yourself any more benefit than if you're eating the piece of chicken or the fish or you're eating the Beyond Meat burger. But what I do think you're doing is you're helping the planet. You're saving Mm. the animals. And so whatever your reason is, but I think you just have to be cognizant and aware of what's in those those labels. You have to read the labels because they're long. (laughs) There's a lot of things in there you can't pronounce, a lot of processed chemicals, things like that. So and I I don't want to say I, I don't think those products have a purpose because I think they do and I think they get people pushed into the vegan world and then they have these moments where they think well I can kind of build that and make it a little bit healthier so I am okay with these products we, we didn't have them before at least we have options for people mm. uh, so so I guess I guess I think it's a I think it's all a good thing I think it's the way we are walking into this because I think we have to stop um, slaughtering animals and you know, mm-hmm. get, having having crop farms with hundreds and hundreds of acres of cut down forests and things like that. So I, I'm I'm not going to criticize the plant based the the vegan products for sure. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think for loads of people, they sort of view them as a as a transition anyway. And certainly on this yeah. on this podcast, we've had lots of conversations with folks who've sort of said, you know, I I started there and perhaps they were useful as a transitioning tool. Um, but then I discovered, you know, more whole foods. I discovered cooking and so on and so mm-hmm. forth. Um, and that seems mm-hmm. to be a fairly common story these days, perhaps that yeah. wasn't maybe 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And I, I use some of those products. I mean, we have Beyond Sausage. So sometimes if I'm going somewhere and nobody's plant-based, I'll take that lasagna and I'll put a little bit of the Beyond Meat Sausage in there. And then that, that gets people asking questions like, Oh, this is really good. It's vegan. Can I can you share the recipe? So I I just feel like that just helps to pull people in. It leads on to a wider point generally, actually, about um, 
uh, when people kind of come into the the the, the whole food plant based uh, world of eating. Um, as opposed to sort of the broader world of veganism, but they're sort of narrow into that kind of whole food, plant-based mm-hmm. nutrition. Um, they can sometimes see it as um, maybe too restrictive and that they need to avoid this and that. And especially in the world of social media, there's so many folks advocating for uh, exclusions and restrictions and you can't have this and you shouldn't do that. And and I'd just like to get your sort of take on it. As someone who's been immersed in this world for for, for some decades, it would be great to kind of understand your your view on some of those sort of more restrictive right. viewpoints. Right. That's a big question. <laughs> I love that question. So th- there are there are, there are a lot of people who, as they start to feel better, and they eat plant based, they begin to feel better. So they start to eliminate things, which some of those things that's fine to eliminate. But I think there's this extremism within the community where there are people that are not using any sugar or any. We don't use oil because I I think there's other places you can get fat. We can talk about that, but. They're not using mm-hmm. salt, um, and they're not flavoring the food. So I talked to my father-in-law, Colin, about this quite a bit, and he says, you know, there's really no research out there that says we can't use minimal amounts of sugar to enhance flavors or, you know, salt our food to make something taste a little better. Where we get into trouble is when we're eating processed foods that have lots of sugar and lots of salt and lots mm-hmm. of oil. But I, I think the extremism that that goes on um, is dangerous because I think people think that that's, that that's what a vegan diet is. Also, I do believe that we do need to have, you know, nuts and seeds. I mean, there's, there's this whole um, school of thought where we should avoid nuts and seeds and avocados because there's fat in it. And fat is, you know, you do need some fat in your diet and that's the best way to get it is through eating nuts and seeds and avocados. I mean, sh- if we eat them the way nature presents them, not the way Costco presents them. I don't know if you have a Costco, but it's a big, huge grocery store here. Yep. You know, they come in buckets and they're already shelled. So so that, that we don't want to eat them that way. I think eating a lot of nut butters, that's not how nature presents nuts and seeds. They present it in the shell. And it takes a little bit of time to get, get the actual seed and the nut. But um, so that that's, I, I just feel like people really um focus too much on the details and not the whole picture Mm. and i suppose it's an element of if you take sugar the demonizing of sugar per se is uh almost it's pretty pretty reductive really it's just sort Mm -hmm. of uh, taking this this one element um and ignoring all of the cases where sugar appears naturally in foods and you know sugar plus the fiber as is my sort of limited understanding isn't such a bad thing you know when it's in fruit that's fine but as soon as you start removing the two and processing that's where you run into trouble uh am i am i right in my my sort of assessment you are you are absolutely right and i think there's a lot of people as, as they start to reduce sugar and fats they replace it with with, you know, using dates, and I think that's great because um, it's more of a whole food. But here's where the problem lies. I think people, um, and instead of using a date, they might use bags of dates <laughs> as a substitute for sugar. Mm. And so you just still have to be aware, you know, how much, how many raisins are you putting a half cup of raisins on your oatmeal in the morning because that's a lot of sugar. So just, just really being aware and thinking about how these things are presented to us in nature yeah, because you do you do need these things. I don't use oil. What I do use instead of oil is I use nuts and seeds because that that's what makes a dress. It's mm. what carries flavor. It's what makes a dressing have that nice, creamy, smooth texture. So I think instead of using oils, that it's a great you know it's it's great to use um, you know nuts and seeds for things like that. This one's a real fundamental sort of question, I guess. But for folks who um, who perhaps haven't done a lot of the, the this kind of cooking, the whole food plant based mm-hmm. cooking, where they're where they're removing oil, what right. what do you use instead? You know, if I pick up your cookbook, uh, what where do I start in terms of like? Because I think it's almost the default position for most of us mm-hmm. uh, who aren't who aren't thinking about oil is to t- turn on the 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 hob put the pan on and put some oil in. It's like the default kind of position. So where do we start? So let's let's start with the pan and the oil because that's the first thing people do is they they throw the oil in and then they saute the onions and they go from there. 
I don't do that. I just I throw the onions in, I throw the mushrooms or whatever it is you're sauteing, and sometimes I'll add a little splash of water or vegetable broth or wine or whatever it is I'm cooking with. You really mm. don't need that oil. And the nice thing about getting rid of the oil when you're cooking is that you're not getting it all over your cabinets and in your kitchen. You're not having to turn that fan on to grab all the, the greasy stuff. So my kitchen's a lot cleaner than it was 30 years ago. Um, so I would say when you're cooking and you're making things, casseroles and cooking on stovetop, you really don't need the oil bottle. As far as making dressings and sauces and things you know like that, I use nuts and seeds, but I don't use lots of them. So if I'm making, let's say I'm making a ranch dressing, I might use a half a cup of cashews or a half a cup of tahini if I'm doing a lemon tahini sauce. You can use sesame seeds are wonderful, and a lot of people miss the sesame seed oil, right? Because that has a lot of flavor. But if you toast mm. your sesame seeds and then you grind them up a little bit, you're going to get just the same amount of flavor. So if you go to my cookbook, you're going to see things like tofu. You're going to see all kinds of nuts and seeds, hemp seeds and sunflower seeds, cashews, walnuts. You'll see things like that, and uh, that that's how we how we build sauces. And um, yeah, that's pretty pretty. It's pretty. It's a hab, It's a habit. You you have to kind of just get used to it. And once you start doing it, you'll realize, wow. The oil. I mean, I never use oil, and I don't even think about using oil. I just really mm. think it's a, it's it's a habit. When you go back to the sort of the the early days when you were cooking this way, how difficult did you find it? You you, you mentioned there that you sort of it's like almost these learned behaviours, and that you're you're now in a place where you just don't even think about it. Um, what was it like to sort of unlearn those behaviours, if you like, and and relearn these new ones? Mm -hmm. Did you find it difficult at the beginning? You know, that's a really good question because. Nelson and I didn't wake up overnight and become whole food plant-based or vegan or whatever the term you want to use. We didn't do it overnight. For a long time, I was still buying those olive oil bottles and I was using, um, you know, sprays and we had margarines and uh, I'd get a little bit of cheese and I'd use that in a casserole. So it didn't happen for me overnight, but we, we transitioned out of it. So it, for me, it was a slow process. Um, and I think we started in the eighties, but I, the more I did, and for, I'll give you an example. I used to make cookies and I, when I first started making cookies, I put mm -hmm. half the butter in, this was back in 1980. And then I put a quarter of the butter in. And then I realized, well, I don't even need the butter. I can just use peanut butter, right? Or almond butter. And then, mm. um, then I started reducing that a little bit and then using some almond flour to grab the fat there. So it was, I would say it was a slow uh, progression. And then back in, I want to say it was like 2000, Colin um, wrote this story in his book called Whole. I don't know if you're familiar with the book Whole, but he told the story about my mother-in-law who got melanoma. And it was stage three melanoma, and it just mm -hmm. shocked all of us. She was just like the pillar of the family. And she didn't, she opted out of the treatments, and she just had it surgically removed. And it was at that point, everybody got really serious about getting, you know, all of the, the oils and, you know, any little thing that we were sneaking in, some of the processed mm -hmm. products. That's when we all, as a family, I think it, we all, it hit us that, wow, you know, you can still get sick and be a vegan because there's so many things that you can eat out there that are not healthy. So that's when we really started cleaning up our diet. Yeah, it doesn't feel like that long ago, mm -hmm. but I guess I guess it was. But that, you know, sometimes I think for a lot of people you have to have that moment or that time when you when it hits you that you you have to get serious. You're not getting any younger and you you have to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. She's healthy now. She's doing great and it's never come back. So uh yeah she's our food police thinking she, of yeah. the <laughs> <laughs> th th thinking of the new book uh that uh, comfort food and then thinking right back to the beginning of your journey do you think you would have uh you were seeing food in that way when you were when you were first particularly after that like you say that sort of um fairly shocking moment in the family where everyone started to get really serious do, did you think kind of 
comfort food was what what food was kind of for at that point or was it very much like actually at this point we're, we're just it's purely about a uh, good quality nutrition and we don't need to worry about the kind of the the wider picture of food that it plays in our kind of lives do you think that book is kind of almost right for now it, it probably wouldn't have been written back then yeah i i agree i think i think what you're saying is the whole eat to live versus live to eat right where, mm. you know, what, where, what, what role does food play in our life? Is it for pleasure or is it for nutrition? I think it's both. I think I think it's both. And I think this book, um, I'm going to show the book so people know this is the book. Um, but this book, I think, kind of pairs the two of them together. I think that we we do right. get pleasure from what we eat. And it's important to, to get pleasure from what you eat. Because if you don't, you're probably not going to stick with it. You're going to go off you know, fall off the wagon a bit. So I think this book is, it's very pleasurable, but it's also very healthy. And I don't think there's anything in here in this book that's highly processed that I would feel like people shouldn't eat. In fact, when we did our immersion, which we have another documentary coming out, we did an immersion a year ago in Greensboro, North Carolina. And we had six diabetics that came in, and I fed them food from this cookbook and from the other cookbooks every day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, I had another chef, Fernando Peralta, and I. We cooked all the food for people um, for 10 days. And I don't want to tell what this is the end of the story because I want people <coughs> to watch the documentary, but we had some amazing results with our participants just amazing and you know i i see it and i hear about it but when you're actually living with these people and you see the results of the, the food and and but they received pleasure from the food i mean they were coming up to me saying i've never eaten this much food in my life and they loved it i mean it was always <laughs> what's what's for dinner what's for lunch what are we going to have for dessert so they were they were getting pleasure and they were also getting healthier so i think the two go together Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I couldn't agree more with that point about um, y you're sticking with it, your longevity when it comes to these kind of um, these kind of switches, you know, for folks who are uh, perhaps, you, you know, as this as this episode comes out, we may be in veganuary, maybe some some folks who are new to this whole world listening um, and um, sticking with it is kind of key. And um, we talked about it in terms of um you know, sacrificing things and exclusion initially, but it, it also needs to go the other way as, as well in terms of like, you know, comfort and traditions and uh, cultures and these kind of things that are so important to us as, as humans, mm -hmm. as society, um, that, yeah, I, I love the fact that you're kind of like, you've integrated those two things so kind of uh, closely together. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have a question on it generally, which is, how difficult is it to 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 execute those recipes in your in your book because i think that's the other kind of thing that uh, concerns people when they come into this world is is complexity and ingredients they've never heard of and this kind of stuff uh, how would you rate it on the difficulty scale in in the world we live in today i would i would call it an easy cookbook um I, you know, I, I provide a pantry list, so I think just setting up your pantry and getting some of those basic ingredients. Um, I don't use anything too weird. I, I think most of what I use is are things that you can get in a mainstream grocery store, and that's why I did it, because I wanted people to be able to open up the book and cook some of these foods with what they have. I mean, my, my mother is not plant-based. Um, my sisters aren't plant-based, mm -hmm. but I can go to their house and I can make these re some of the recipes. Um, but I also, one of them is kind of, she's, she's kind of testing out plant-based. And so she has a lot of the pantry items, you know, things like nutritional yeast flakes. She's always got tofu mm -hmm. in her refrigerator and a pretty, um, a, 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 pr a pretty good spice rack. Cause that's, you know, I think when you're using, I think even if you're not plant-based, you want a really good spice rack. But keeping the, the mm -hmm. recipes pretty simple. But I, I, I do put some that are a little more complicated because you always have that foodie that wants to stand in their kitchen all afternoon and make yeah. something really complex. And, and I, I have a couple of those in there because I like to do that too. But I would say for the most part, every cookbook I have, especially this one, is very easy to execute a recipe from based on what people have in there you have onion powder garlic powder nutritional yeast a few nuts and seeds i think you're good to go 
Are, are there some favourites? Are there some recipes that that really kind of like you're you're super proud of and can't wait to get out there? Yeah, I, I'm really proud of the lasagna stew. I've mentioned that in other podcasts. I really love that recipe because lasagna takes a little bit of time and you have to layer it and you have to bake it for an hour. But this is a soup. It's a stew and it tastes just like lasagna. So I love that one. My daughter went to Spain a couple years ago and came back and said, Mom, you have to make paella. <laughs> and uh, so I had to try it first with the, tr- the traditional version. And I think you have to do that. You have to try the traditional version and then make your version. So I made a paella and then I invited her over and she loved it. So that one's a little more complex. There's a little more ingredients involved in it. Um, I have a Malay sauce that I use with enchiladas and I love that recipe. It's a super easy. Now Malay is, it takes a lot of time and it's, you know, the same thing with tamales, a tamale recipe that is definitely more complex, but I cut corners and take shortcuts. So those are some of my favorite recipes. And then I kept this, this particular cookbook is very strong in the desserts. We have a lot of yummy desserts, the key lime pie, and we have peanut butter cup bars, which I love. Um, I have lemon bars that are made from Japanese sweet potatoes. There's just a lot of really good desserts. And I'm not a dessert person, but I love these desserts. I could skip dessert, but I will never sk- skip breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I very much am a dessert person, so I'm super excited to hear that, <laughs> that there is a, a good dessert section. Because uh, yeah, I do. I do think that like, um, uh, with the often when people hear whole food, plant based nutrition, they they think that's the sort of thing I'm going to miss out on. I'm going to miss mm-hmm. out on dessert, for example. I'm going to miss out on the treats uh like the comfort food generally so having these things in there i just think is so is so crucial to help people on this kind of journey absolutely Mm -hmm. and you know i think people think that if you're vegan you're you know we talked about limiting ingredients i think the world of plants is much larger than the world of animal products there are so many Mm. plants that i'm still learning i go to the asian market and there's you know, jackfruit's an example. There's all kinds of different potatoes and squashes, mushrooms. The world of mushrooms is, I'm still exploring that one. So I feel like there's a lot more diversity <laughs> in plants than animals. 100%. 100%. And actually, you just, you triggered a thought in me then, which is, you know, in our in our sort of um, social media influenced world where there's lots of kind of quote unquote kind of fitness and health influencers, you often hear uh the sort of the the plate described as your protein and your carbs and your um you know and your fats and kind of everything is one of these three things um and just as you were talking there i thought about actually when you when you eat like that when you're kind of living your life through my fitness pal um yeah, there's a potential for you uh, missing all kinds of diversity and all kinds of like um, the, the kind of micronutrients that you'd be getting from exploring the world of mushrooms, for example. Uh, that, that was the thing that triggered in me when you said that. Yeah, yeah. I, I th- so I have a couple family members, not my family, but my extended family that do the keto, right? Because it works. Keto works. You right. lose weight on keto, but it's not long term. And the health damage the damages that you do to your body long term being on a keto diet i think are um there's a lot of them i mean there's if you're eating a lot of meat and dairy and you know you're really limiting your calories to that um long term you're going to end up with heart disease cancers all sorts of things that's that's another topic but Mm -hmm. I i think when you eat like that like you said my fitness pal you are you you are living in this box but once you venture out of that and you are trying all the different kinds of plants and not worrying about, oh, how much protein is in that um, kabocha squash or, you know, how many, what am I getting in, in my, I don't know, mushroom? You, I don't think like that about food. And I've had people write and say, how come you don't provide the nutrient analysis? Well, I don't think that any of these um, software programs that, look at the nutrient analysis of a recipe are accurate you plug it into a different software you're going to get something really different Mm -hmm. and my father-in-law says there's no way that you can look at a recipe and determine 
all the things that are in those foods. And it also depends on if you're buying it organic or you mm -hmm. know, conventional. So I think looking at the nutrition and the calories all the time, oh, that's just so limiting. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent, and it almost pushes you as well to eat processed food. I find because you're, you're, the whole system is based on you scanning a barcode in the main. <laughs> I mean, you can put in homemade meals, but, but, but it's difficult to put in homemade meals. So it's it's mm -hmm. often if you're in that that world, it's easier to scan something. Mm -hmm. So it sort of almost pushes you to eat like that, which I think, well, that that can't be right. You know that <laughs> if we if think sort of China study and we think sort of the things that we know, uh, mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't add up. <laughs> No, no. And, you know, we've never been one to count calories and, you know, look at protein. I, protein's in everything. There's a little bit of fat mm -hmm. in everything. So, yeah, just kind of whittling it down to one nutrient. There's so many nutrients, but, but one nutrient. We I don't know. We've just sort of demonized fat and put protein up on a pedestal if it's got protein it's great so eat your tofu and eat your you know soy curls because mm -hmm. people love protein I, I don't know what that's about <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's it's i think it's purely marketing is my my guess it's sort of mm -hmm. marketing plus uh sort of the vanity of the of social media i think pushes the yeah. agenda on that um yeah. certainly in the in the modern times i know there's been equivalents of the sort of protein hype before social media but certainly in mm -hmm. today's world i feel like it's uh been supercharged by that mm -hmm. <laughs> by that mm -hmm. by that kind of world of fitness influencers and so on but, you know, I get excited when, when I'm eating, like, mushrooms and someone says you can't get vitamin D without taking it. Well, there's vitamin D in mushrooms. If you put them out in the sun, they absorb the vitamin D. That's exciting. So I think, you know, understanding each food and what's in it and why there's value in it. But just mm. because celery doesn't have a whole lot in it, does it mean that it's not a good food for you? I don't think so. I, th I think there's a lot, a lot more to our food than than we really understand or know. I, I I learn this from Colin all the time. He parrots this over and over and over. Is that we can't, we can't demonize one food um, and you know venture into other foods just because we think that they're superfoods. I love that word superfood. Superfood. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of silly. Hundred <laughs> percent. <laughs> Let's, you mentioned the, the the children there, and I've got a little boy myself who's four, who's been uh, brought up vegan since birth, um, and I'm always thinking about kind of nutrition uh, before. But I was vegan before he was born, but since he's been born, it feels like there's a real microscope on: Are we eating the right stuff? Are we getting the, enough? Uh, into him you know what does he like what doesn't he like how do we disguise various vegetables or if not disguise them how do we get him to sort of love them and so on and so forth mm -hmm. I'd love to get your experience on that having uh, having kids who've kind of been brought up in this this kind of world yeah and you're so fortunate to have your children during this time because there's so much information out there about healthy pregnancies and healthy children uh, I had my first child in 1991, so I was pregnant in the 90s, and there wasn't any information out about this. I went to the doctor, and they're trying to get me to take the prenatal vitamins and, you know, eat your meat and your dairy. Mm -hmm. And Colin's saying, no, 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 you know, you don't need to do that. So I was pretty much plant-based when I was pregnant, but I remember being a little nervous because there wasn't, mm -hmm. there wasn't the... Um, information out there other than what Colin was talking about and I, there were no other moms that were doing the same thing that I was doing so it was hard so it's wonderful that you you have this this uh, time period that you're raising your kids and and, and and you're getting the support that you need from your physicians and your community as far as raising kids this way I think it's it's the easiest thing you're ever going to do because kids will do, they look to you, you're, you're a model. So everything you do, they're watching and right down to what you eat, how you sleep, you know, what books you read, they watch us. And I think food um, is pretty easy to control if you're doing the right things. It's, it's not if you're not doing the right things. 
But I think presenting a lot of different foods to children, getting them to try everything and being involved in the cooking process. So I, there's a picture of it in the cookbook. I have my, my oldest was, I think she was two years old. She, she would get up and stir things and cut things. And to this day, she's probably the best cook in the family because I did that more with her than I did with the other two. <laughs> but getting them in the kitchen, getting them involved, help, letting them plan the meals. Getting those cookbooks out or get the websites out and letting them pick, you know, I want pizza and I want, you know, spaghetti and macaroni and cheese and making it all plant-based, that's the best way to get them on board, involving them. And, and I think we don't give kids enough credit. Yes, they might mm. they might cut their finger now and then and they might have a little accident in the kitchen, but I, I, I just can't emphasize enough getting them involved. I used to teach... Um, mostly middle school, fifth and sixth grade. So the parents always knew I did a little nutrition unit for a week. And I, what I did was I brought the food in and we, we played with artichokes and they ate tofu and we did made some different smoothies and they loved it. And a lot of them would go home and say, I want to go plant-based. So <laughs> I took a little flack from the parents <laughs> on that one, but exposure, just really exposing the kids to it. I think the challenge that you're probably going to have and that I had and most people do is when they go out in the in the world to birthday parties or they're sitting mm. at the lunch table and no one's eating what they're eating or they're trading their food. My mm. son was always trading his food for the hamburger. <laughs> so you, you can't really control <laughs> all of that. But at least if you get them on board and they understand the whys behind it, too, uh, I, I don't think that's as big of a problem because our, our kids did. They... You know, they did all the wrong things when they went to people's houses, and that's part of the learning process. And now they're in their 20s and 30s, and they're all plant-based, and can't say they don't cheat now and then, but they're all plant-based, and they they know the why around it. And I think that's, that's really important mm. when you're raising those little ones. I was going to ask that about, you know, as the as they started to hit the teenage years and so on, whether there was any sort of rebellion almost from, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're living this kind of whole food plant-based diet at home. Um, and you know, we know all the good stuff and we know why did you, did you, do you think they sort of rebelled probably more than other kids? Uh, so I have two girls and a boy and hopefully he won't be listening to this, <laughs> but, the, but the son, the, the middle one was probably more rebellious with the food because he was an athlete, so he was mm -hmm. always at, he was very social. He was always at people's houses and traveling, and I uh, played tra travel soccer and baseball. So he was in that world of n not eating plant based. So I think he did rebel a little bit. He was the one that would he traded out his sandwiches for you know meat <laughs> and things like that. Then he went to college, and I, I would say he was mostly plant based. But if there was a cookout. He was going to have, you know, the hamburger and the beer. And I think partly mm. because maybe he didn't want to be different. But now yeah. he's 29. He's 29 and he's dating a, a, a vegan woman and he's just do, he's doing it. But, yeah, yeah. He, he was the one I probably got most frustrated with. But I think that the key is to just pick your battles and let it go. Mm. Let it go. And hopefully when they're adults and they get older you know they'll they'll go that way which he has but yeah no it, you you can't have three kids and not have challenges <laughs> <laughs> i was going to say I, I can imagine that they're they're thankful now they're older though for the grounding that you've given them in terms of uh, an understanding of nutrition and cooking and so on because i think mm -hmm. you know so, it's so easy in sort of modern society to sort of sleepwalk your way into kind of adulthood with no real understanding of of nutrition and so on until like you mentioned earlier until you have some right. uh, dramatic incident either in your personal life or in your family's life so it's mm -hmm. I, I, I imagine they're pretty they are thankful now now they're adults and they've got that very, grounding very thankful for a lot of things um but they've watched nelson and i were, were so passionate about this and you know nelson's writing he's writing documentaries i'm writing cookbooks and they ha they're oh. all very close to their their grandma and papa which is colin and karen and hmm. uh they they very much respect his his work and his research 
And Karen and Colin are wonderful grandparents. They have a very nice relationship with all of their grandchildren. So that's really helpful too. And yeah, I think the kids are thankful for, for that. It doesn't mean they haven't challenged us on some things. <laughs> but that's, you know, that, that's great that they challenge us. And, and they, you know, when, when we, we go to them, they're the first people we go to when we want them to look at a cookbook or a documentary or um, something that we're doing because they're, they're our biggest fans, but our biggest critics too, right? Kids are that way. Yeah. yeah. T- turning to the, back to the cookbook, I was going to ask about that actually. Is, is, are the family the kind of the, the chief testers? Are they the folks that you, you run every recipe by to sort of give it the quality seal? Sometimes, but not so much. Because <laughs> uh, the, the girls, all of them cook, but they just don't cook fancy. They don't do anything that's, you know, takes a little bit of time and follow recipes. I mean, a lot of times they're just throwing in baked potatoes and doing simple things because all three of them have jobs <laughs> and they're very busy. Um, but w- mm-hmm. this cookbook was tested during the pandemic, 2020 is when we start. I, I get I lose track of the time, but early 2020, we decided to do cook along shows at Plant Pure. So every Thursday for for a year, I think we did 52 or 53 shows. Every Thursday, I would send out recipes and grocery lists, and we would cook together. And it was usually a 30 to 45 minute show and it was live. It was always live. And I must say, I never burned anything when we were live. That was, that was kind of a trick, (laughs) but they were my testers. So when I developed the paella recipe, I was excited. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to do this on live. And they were the ones that were sending me emails or making comments about things. So I feel like this cookbook got tested. The recipes were tested so much. So I compiled all those recipes. I think we did probably 60, 70 recipes during the pandemic. Then I had some that were already stored away and tested. But we have a lot of followers on social media. So every time I post something, Mm -hmm. there's a comment, good, bad, and ugly. And I appreciate (laughs) those because that that helps me to hone in and get better at what I do. So I feel like our kids are not our testers. They'll make something if it's really good. um, But I would say it's our... It's our community and our fans that have really helped us. Well, I can't wait to get a, get a hold of a copy. I think it's 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 a really valuable resource uh, and an addition to the sort of the, the what's already out there that's unique. So I, I really appreciate uh, you and your work and and this new cookbook uh, for folks who uh, would love to get hold of a copy too. Where would they go about finding out a little bit more? Um, if you go to Amazon, I, I, you can order you can order the cookbook through Amazon. Um, you can get uh, there's sample recipes on my Instagram page. I post all, everything I cook almost every other day, if not more, on Instagram. And if you go to Instagram, it tells you how to find the recipe if I posted something. So I'm giving people little sneak peeks of of the recipe. Um, but Jim, one thing I wanted to share with people is that the documentary that Nelson is doing comes out in January, and it's called From From Mm -hmm. Food to Freedom. And it's an amazing documentary. So I feel like this book kind of pairs with that nicely because we used a lot of these recipes. So I would say you could go to Plant Pure Chef to find out more um, on Instagram and Facebook and then Plant Pure Nation on Instagram and Facebook. So I'm kind of, I kind of have my, my hands in that too. I'm not great at social media, but I'm getting better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'll make sure there's links uh, to the documentary and of course to the book uh, in the show notes. So uh, folks can head down there and uh, find out all they need to know and pick up a copy and watch the documentary and so on. So uh, Kim, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it, especially as it's uh, super early in the morning there. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me.